In this lecture, we're reviewing the different types of nerve cells. There's really only two classes. There's neurons and there's glia. Glia are sometimes also called neuroglia. And, and what that really means is the glue that holds the nervous system together. And that was originally what we thought of when we thought of glia. They were just glue. They were just kind of packing peanuts there to spread the neurons apart. Now, of course, that's not true. And since then, we've come to understand the, some of the functions of the different glial cells out there. But of course, a lot remains unknown. I'm going to cover the, the, the functions that we feel pretty good about with glial cells, but I want you to remember that there's a lot we still don't know about them. We do know that neurons are the cells that are specialized for rapid communication. So when you think nervous tissue, it's totally fair if you just think neurons. So we'll first review the morphology of neurons, and then we'll talk about synapses. Really, there's only two types there. There's electrical and chemical. And of those two, chemical is what it's all about. That's the majority of the synapses that we find in the nervous system. And then we'll finish up with the glia. Neurons have a very complex morphologies that allow them to communicate effectively. So the when you when you think of a neuron, you you probably think of well, first a, a central cell body, and then coming off of that a whole bunch of extensions. Now collectively we call these extensions neurites, and they're branching. In some cases, very extensively. And in other cases, not so much. We should also, of course, think of an axon. And so what we create is a cell really with two sides. That's what we call neurons polar. One end we think of as the receptive end. And that would be the dendrites. That's where we get inputs from other cells. The cell body is special because it contains a nucleus. This is where all the signals from the dendrites integrate and sum together. And if we get enough excitation, we fire an action potential down the axon to spit out neurotransmitters. So we can communicate with some other neuron, or maybe a muscle, a gland, or we might just spit neurotransmitters into the blood. But all neurons are going to have a cell body and an axon. Then they have a variable number of dendrites. This is what distinguishes different types of neurons. Some of them have zero dendrites. So let's have a look at the different types of, of neurons. The unipolar neurons, or pseudo-unipolar neurons, shown in panels A and C, they have no true dendrites. They have specialized extensions coming off of the axon that can sense things like pressure on the skin, for example, or heat, or cold, or acid. But they're not really dendrites. They're not true dendrites coming off of the cell body. They're just specialized uh, parts of the axon. Then in B, we have the bipolar neurons. Bipolar. They only have one dendrite. So these truly just have two sides. There's the receptive end, that'd be the dendrite, and there's the transmissive end, that'd be the axon. These are for very simple relays. We find bipolar cells in the retina, for example, to simply move information from the uh, photoreceptors to the retinal ganglion cells. And then we have the more complicated multipolar neurons. And this is what we see predominantly in the central nervous system. So you can see in panel D, three different types of multipolar neurons increasing in their dendritic complexity. Some, like the uh, motor neurons, are going to be multipolar um, with fairly equal dendrites. No principal dendrite like we see in pyramidal neurons. So that that middle neuron there, the pyramidal neuron, 
This has an apical dendrite, so one of the dendrites is much larger than the others. And it usually has some distal sprouting, usually some proximal sprouting as well, and then there are a variable number of basal dendrites that come off on the other end of the cell body. And usually the axon projects downward. Pyramidal neurons would be the upper motor neurons. The lower motor neurons would be those kind of multipolar cells on the left there. So a little different morphology, both motor neurons. And then we have a Purkinje cell. Purkinje cells have very complicated dendritic arbors, and these are also involved in movement, just like motor neurons. But Purkinje cells are there for motor learning. So they need to be able to work with uh, a lot more different types of information than motor neurons, so that they can create some complicated movement patterns like this. So depending on the number of dendrites, that determines essentially how much stuff you can listen to. The more information you have to integrate, the more dendrite you need. If you're just a simple relay, you might not even need dendrites. And at most you need one. You're a bipolar or a unipolar neuron. Now we don't have unipolar neurons, we only have pseudo-unipolar neurons. Insects have unipolar neurons. So we can see here a whole lot of branching of dendrites. Some dendrites have things called dendritic spines. They're little protrusions coming off the dendrite. And the cool thing about these is that they grow and shrink. And we think that that's the way that we can encode new information and lose it rapidly. So we can grow a new synapse in the form of a dendritic spine. Over time we could strengthen that synapse by increasing the size of the spine. So we could learn something. We could make one synapse stronger. Of course, it would be many, many synapses. So we can solidify some pattern. We can make sure that neurons are able to uh, reliably activate one another. Or we could forget. We could get rid of that synapse so that we remove a pattern. So you'll create some patterns in this class, and the stuff that you never use again, which will be most of it, you'll probably forget it those spines will wither, and you'll create new patterns in your hippocampus for all the stuff that you use on the daily. Now just like dendrites branch, so do axons. Now every neuron only has one axon, but that axon can branch extensively. So they could hit one part of the brain, two parts of the brain, one cell, many cells. It depends on the neuron. But just because there's one axon doesn't mean we only hit one target. And regardless of your morphology, whether you're a made-up neuron, like that model neuron they're showing on the left, a, a humble pseudo-unipolar neuron, like our somatosensory neurons, or something a little more complicated, like a motor neuron, doesn't matter. You have a site where you receive input. That would be the dendrites. I already erased it. You have a place where you integrate that input. That's going to be the cell body. Then you have a conductive portion, that's the axon. Every neuron has an axon. And then you have the output. Those will be your presynaptic terminals. You might communicate with another neuron. You might communicate with a muscle. Or you might even dump neurotransmitter into the blood. And it doesn't matter. You still have the same basic parts. Now within the neuron, we find, of course, the cytoskeleton. We can see here the nucleus shown in blue. We have yellow microtubules and purple microfilaments or actin filaments. Now we're not looking at the neurofilaments here. Neurofilaments are just intermediate filaments for neurons. Think of these as rebar. They hold the cell together and that's about it. There's no directionality. Microtubules and microfilaments, they provide some support for the cell but they also allow for transport and that's the key aspect here. Microtubules originate in the center of the cell and radiate outward. And they almost always point their plus end toward the periphery. So we have a cell here. Let's go ahead and give it an axon going down. Here's my nucleus. All of the microtubules line up and point their plus end toward the periphery. So if we have a motor protein like kinesin, that always runs toward the plus end. Dynein, on the other hand, is going to run toward the minus end. And that allows us to move stuff down the axon. 
This is pretty important because neurons don't make proteins in the axon. It's a little more complicated in the dendrites. The plus and minus ends are chaotically arranged. But in the axon, very clear cut. So when we're thinking microtubules, we should think of long distance transport, particularly in the axon, because it needs it. It doesn't make proteins. So you can see here, we have anterograde transport. That means down the axon toward the synapse. That's going to bring things like fresh organelles, such as mitochondria, fresh vesicles uh, to, to store and then release neurotransmitters, fresh neurotransmitter precursors. And then we have retrograde transport by dining, where we go from the synapse toward the cell body. And this is used to uh, remove old, worn out organelles and also to bring in signaling endosomes. More on that in just a bit. Then, right at the periphery of the cell, we have actin filaments. And actin filaments are what fill up those dendritic spines. You find actin all along the periphery of the cell, and that's what gives it its shape. So, if the cell wants to stick out a little extension, it does that with actin. It then later fills in microtubules to make it stable. But actin is the more dynamic cytoskeletal filament. So on those dendritic spines that come off the dendritic shaft there, the head is filled with actin so that it can change. It can grow to strengthen or it can shrink to weaken. There are also, of course, motor proteins that run along actin filaments. Myosin is going to accomplish that. So we have some long-range transport with microtubules and then we have more local transport along our actin filaments. So for the long range, think kinesin and dynein, and then for short range, that's going to be myosin. And there's different forms of myosin that run in different directions. Now the cell body doesn't seem like it has a lot going on, because it's just a little kind of round area. It's not as elaborate as dendrites and axons, but it's very important because that's where we create proteins. It contains some missile substance, which would be ribosomes, the rough ER, and, and Golgi. It's all the stuff needed for translation. And of course, it contains the nucleus, where it has the DNA, where we carry out transcription. So when you think cell body, we should be thinking protein production or gene expression. They're pretty much the same thing. That's a key aspect of cell body function. The other aspect is to integrate all those synaptic potentials from the dendrites. So we can determine, should I communicate with my partners? Right, so we find a whole lot of nissel substance in the cell body, a little bit in the dendrites, none in the axon. That's why we need axonal transport. Here's a little cartoon showing us the summation of synaptic potentials. Now, a single synapse in the central nervous system is weak. One synapse will not get the job done. Just one little bit of excitatory input will not cause an action potential. The central nervous system is very democratic, so we need a lot of input. Synchronously, on our dendrites, so we need to get some depolarization at many synapses. Now, as that depolarization moves into the cell body, it weakens a bit. That's why we need so much excitatory input at the same time, so we can take our membrane potential and hopefully depolarize the threshold so that we fire an action potential. This is not drawn to scale. We'll talk a whole lot more about that in lectures three and four, and probably the rest of the class, but we'll get quite a bit in three and four. If we do excite the cell, the action potential travels down the axon. The axon is a, a wonderful place to generate an action potential for two good reasons. First, it's much thinner than the cell body, so it has an increase in resistance as a result. Now, if you don't remember Ohm's Law, you will by the end of this class, and so the potential change, V, is equal to the current times the resistance. So if we have resistance, the higher the resistance, the easier it is to build up a charge. So all that charge that's moving through the cell body essentially concentrates in the narrow axon. So the charge amplifies because of the higher resistance. So that's one aspect. The second important aspect is shown here. 
This neuron was filled with sulforotamine, which is just a red dye, and then they stained it for uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. So they used an antibody that stuck to those, and, and then they colored them green. So you can see here, a big red cell body and then a green axon coming off. The axon's filled with sodium channels. That's key because sodium channels are what cause the depolarization that we get in the action potential. So there's the action potential actually drawn to scale here. That depolarization requires sodium channels and the axon's full of them. Now the axon may very well also be covered with myelin to speed up signal transduction. We'll talk about that in lecture four as well. Now the purpose of firing action potential and having it travel down the axon is to release neurotransmitters. We want to communicate. That's the job of neurons. So here in this cartoon, that kind of pink presynaptic neuron there fires an action potential. It spits out a little green neurotransmitter, and then that purple neuron gets a bit of depolarization. Remember, one action potential is not going to cut it. We're going to need a lot of input to get our democratic neurons to fire action potential. The other important aspect of the axon is, of course, transport of proteins. So anterograde transport goes from cell body down the axon, and that's to make sure that our axon has enough proteins to do everything that needs to be done. If something happens in life, it's because a protein did it. Since the axon can't make proteins, it has to import them. Now, there's two different speeds of anterograde transport that we see. There's the rapid transport and the slow transport. Rapid's obviously faster than slow, hence the name. The difference has to do with how well these uh, different molecules stick to kinesin, the motor protein. Think of kinesin as uh, like one of those motorized walkways in the airport. A treadmill, <laughs> to put it uh, more simply, an idiot. So if you're always getting on and off the treadmill, you're not going to get to the end as quickly as if you just get on and wait. So rapid transport occurs because of stable binding to kinesin. So as that motor protein runs down the microtubules, if you hold on the whole time, you make it to the end with it. Not everything holds on the whole time. Some things are a little fickle. The soluble proteins, the skeletal proteins, those don't seem to bind as well, so they're constantly hopping off, and then as that kinesin moves on down, they hop onto the, a new kinesin, so it sets them back a little bit, and hence the slower transport. Now the data that we're looking at here on the top, this is just showing that there, there are indeed different populations of, uh, of uh, molecules that are transported. Some go quickly, some go slowly. So when they deliver a little bit of radioactivity and then follow it over time, that's the pulse chase experiment, they see some things arrive very quickly, other things moderately quickly, and other things slowly. So there's a, a couple types of slow transport. If you want to actually see some transport, here it is. So those red dots that are running around, those are track A receptors. That's a neurotrophin receptor. Some are moving anterograde very quickly. Some are moving retrograde. So follow the red dots. Some just zip down the axon from left to right. That's anterograde. Right to left, retrograde. Right, so we're, we're replenishing the axon with track A receptors. And then, after hopefully some NGF binds to it, we take it back to the cell body. So we have both anterograde and retrograde transport going on all the time. Retrograde transport is fairly rapid. It's not as rapid as rapid anterograde transport, but it's definitely not as slow as slow anterograde transport. Anyway, it goes in the other direction. It's a different motor protein. It's dynein. Runs the other way. Now there's a couple things that we want to take back to the cell body. First of all, track A. If NGF binds to track A, we need to take it back to the nucleus so it can stimulate the expression of anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins and help keep the neuron alive, right? We don't want to die like we did last semester. We want to keep the neuron alive. In order to do that, we have to take those track A proteins that have NGF, bring them inside, and track them back to the cell body because that's where we affect gene expression. We don't make anything in the axon. The other thing we need to do is clean up the junk. Everything wears out eventually, whether it's a car or an organelle. 
everything eventually breaks. So we have lysosomes to help break down the junk. Well, we need to, of course, move those on back. So part of it's cleanup and part of it's keeping the neuron alive by giving it neurotrophic support. And of course, sometimes toxins and viruses get into the nervous system that way, just like they did last semester. So anything that can stick to those axonal proteins and get internalized, well, they can come along for the ride too, like the rabies virus, for example, or as written on this slide, tetanus toxin. Now, the, the morphology of neurons is, is elaborate so that they can communicate, and the site that they communicate at is the synapse. There's really two types, electrical, chemical. Electrical, very simple. Two cells share their cytoplasm. No neurotransmitter needed. They just bump up next to each other, and then they make some holes in their membrane so that any charge that enters cell one can easily enter cell two and vice versa. So if I get some depolarization over here, it just flows on over through these holes. Now these holes are called gap junctions. They're made of connection proteins on each cell there. So if we have a look at the cartoon, you can see a gap junction. So the membrane comes very close between two different cells and the connexin proteins connect. And when they do, they form a channel where ions can freely flow between the cell. And what this does is synchronize the activity of neurons so that they can act as a unit. Not every neuron is connected with these. These are not as common as chemical synapses. It's only in neurons that want to act in concert. So, if we have a look at the recordings there, what they're doing is recording from two nearby neurons. You can see the pipettes attached to their membrane. They blow up in a hole so they can actually record the electrical activity. And then they'll just inject current. So if you, if you look on the bottom, there's those square waves. That's the injection of current, either positive to depolarize or negative to hyperpolarize. They're injecting in cell one, and then they're recording in cell one and cell two. And what you see is that the membrane potential in cell 2 changes in accord with that in cell 1 because they have gap junctions. So the charge that you inject in cell 1 flows over to cell 2. It doesn't depolarize or hyperpolarize as much because they only have these little tiny holes to move through, but it still changes its membrane potential just like cell 1. And this allows them to act in concert. If cell 1 were to depolarize even more and fire an action potential, so would its neighbor. You'll notice the pyramidal neurons on the right, even though they're injecting current into cell one, nothing's going on in cell two, because they don't have gap junctions. They do definitely form chemical synapses though, right? This is the most common synapse out there. So when you think synapse, think chemical synapse. All right, there's only two, maybe three parts of a chemical synapse. First, we have the presynaptic terminal. The important feature there would, of course, be synaptic vesicles. This is where the neurotransmitters lie. And we always have a reserve pool. We'll talk about this more in Lecture 5. But we have our presynaptic site. Then between there, the pre- and postsynaptic neuron, I'll put this on a little stubby spine. We have our synaptic cleft. This thing is only about 20 nanometers, so they're really close to one another. On the postsynaptic side of things, we don't have neurotransmitter vesicles. Instead, we have neurotransmitter receptors. So if we fire an action potential in the presynaptic site, which is almost always an axon, we release neurotransmitters. A couple of these will fuse. We'll fill the synaptic cleft with neurotransmitter. Those postsynaptic neurotransmitter receptors then let some ions flow in to change the membrane potential. So we'll go from a resting minus 70 or so to a, oh, let's say minus 50, at least out in the dendrites. 
it'll be much smaller by the time it makes it to the cell body. So there's really two parts. A, a lot of times we'll also see some glial component as well. So usually there's an astrocyte hugging this synapse, and that's going to help clean stuff up. We'll talk about them later. Now usually synapses form between axons and dendrites because they just have much larger surface area. It's just chance. There's a whole lot more membrane on dendrite than cell body. And the axon is specialized for communication. So most synapses are axodendritic. <clears throat> if we have a look here, uh, we can see two different types of axodendritic synapses in the middle. One's on the spine. That is almost always excitatory. And then there's one on a closer, more proximal portion of the dendritic shaft. Those are usually inhibitory. So, for neurons, most of the inhibitory synapses are going to be close to the cell body. So most of the inhibitory input will be either on the cell body itself, those are called axosomatic synapses, or on the proximal dendrites. And that's because of how inhibitory synapses work. We'll talk about them later. They wouldn't be useful if they were in the distal dendrites. No, instead of the distal dendrites, that's where we're going to find our excitatory synapses. So those tend to be farther away. And what that does is allow the inhibitory synapses to trump the excitatory synapses. So as that positive charge is moving toward the cell body, it can leak out whenever we stimulate the inhibitory synapses. So usually the presynaptic site uh, is going to be the axon, the postsynaptic site is going to be the dendrite. It could also be the cell body. Now there are some other synapses that are a little less common, like axo-axonic synapses. And that's where an axon synapses onto another axon. That could be in one of two places. Right here at the initial segment, to prevent us from firing an action potential. Notice that's close to the cell body, so that's in our range of inhibitory synapses. Or it could be right out at the end, right at the presynaptic site. And that's to affect how much neurotransmitter we release. These axoaxonic synapses can be either excitatory or inhibitory. So inhibitory uh, axoaxonic synapses are going to decrease the amount of neurotransmitter released. So they're going to decrease the postsynaptic response. Even though this cell fires an action potential, it has less of an effect on its target. Excitatory input will facilitate the amount of neurotransmitter release and allow this neuron to have a greater impact on its target. And then, of course, we can have dendrodendritic synapses as well. Anything, any part of the neuron can communicate with another part of the neuron. And these can work unidirectionally, bidirectionally, doesn't matter. They can be excitatory or inhibitory. These are a little less common, but they do exist. Now, chemical synapses don't, don't have to always just be 20 nanometers apart. Sometimes the, the neurotransmitters act over much longer distances. So we could dump neurotransmitters into the blood, or we can operate by volume transmission. Our monoaminergic uh, neurotransmitters uh, tend to exhibit volume transmission, but you will never see it in glutamate. So something like dopamine can act over longer regions. So when we talk about volume transmission, what that means is that we release dopamine at some site away from the synapse and allow it to diffuse over a large volume to encounter its target. So if I have dopamine input onto this neighboring neuron over here, I could also release it out into the extracellular fluid so that it eventually encounters this neuron I don't even have a synapse with. In fact, it'll diffuse and encounter multiple neurons. That's the purpose of volume transmission. So it's not the intimate one-to-one -one communication that you get from pre- to postsynaptic site, but instead it's more of just shouting out into the extracellular fluid, here's some dopamine. Peptide neurotransmitters, as a rule, are released from extrasynaptic sites.
So let me redraw our synapse here. Away from the synapse itself, we have dense core vesicles, a little bit bigger, and they have peptide neurotransmitters in them. So they look a little more dense in an electron micrograph. If we fire one action potential, we can spit out some classical neurotransmitters from here. But if we were to fire a burst of action potentials, as we'll talk about in lecture five, that burst is going to cause a buildup of calcium within this presynaptic terminal that will diffuse up and allow for the release of neuropeptides. Notice they're not at the synapse, so they're going to act kind of like volume transmission. They're going to diffuse to multiple sites. And this allows a neuron that's just firing one action potential to say something different from a neuron that's firing many action potentials. And neuropeptides are usually going to cause much more long-lived changes in cell function than something like glutamate or GABA. On to the glia. <clears throat> there are many types of glial cells, and you should think of them as support cells, because neurons can't take care of themselves. They need glia. The ependymal cells are found all throughout the ventricles, and their job is to make cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Cerebrospinal fluid uh, is a solution of ions and, and sugars and neurotransmitters that's going to contribute to making that extracellular fluid that surrounds neurons. It's going to flow through the ventricles, of course, uh, and, and around in the arachnoid space. All that CSF comes from ependymal cells. And these are just little, simple cells that line the vesicles. <clears throat> if we look here on the left, on top is a, a low magnification image of a ventricle. On the bottom, it's blowing up that little rectangle. All those cells are ependymal cells. So what these help do is kind of move CSF around. They have little cilia that kind of flow and help create movement of CSF. But they also interact with blood vessels to create the CSF. And principally, that occurs at uh, organs called, choroid, uh, called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is found within ventricles, and this is a dense collection of blood vessels and ependymal cells. So ependymal cells are going to pull fluid, salt, uh, out, of, out of the blood and use that to create cerebrospinal fluid. That's their only job, create and move cerebrospinal fluid. Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells are there to create myelin. So they're going to wrap around axons. Oligodendrocytes act in the central nervous system, Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. They do some other things, but we'll just think of them as creating myelin. And the purpose of myelin is to speed up communication along the axon. Because when we want to say something, we want to say it now. You want to move now when you want to move. You don't want to have to wait for it. Myelin increases the rate of action potential propagation. We'll talk about how later but you should remember, I hope, that it wraps around the axon to create nodes. Nodes have ion channels. The internodes, that's the myelin. No ion channels. So all that charge that we generate at that initial segment, so we fire our action potential, that's going to propagate rapidly but passively to the next node, where it gets recharged by the ion channels, goes back down, bang, bang, boom. It actually spreads in both directions, it just, it just doesn't do anything with back propagation. I'll explain why in lecture four. So it's going to appear to move unidirectionally on down the axon very quickly because of myelination. If we were to slice through myelin, it would look something very much like this. So on the bottom right, it's showing you an axon. There's a mitochondria in there, MIT. And then wrapping around that is myelin. You can see layer after layer of a cell membrane. So myelin's just a whole bunch of lipids. There's a lot of proteins in there holding things together. But that's it. 
It just creates insulation around the axon so that action potentials propagate more rapidly. Microglia are still the resident macrophages of the brain, just like last semester. So early on in development, some cells from the yolk sac are going to enter the brain before we have a blood-brain barrier and just live there for the, the rest of our lives. So microglia aren't actually glia. Well, they're not actually neural, neuroglia. They're not, they're not nerve cells. They're derived from elsewhere. They're actually kind of like a type of blood cell. They're going to be our immune system if anything goes wrong. Hopefully, peripheral immune cells don't invade the central nervous system. Bad things happen when peripheral immune cells enter the central nervous system. So the microglia are there to clean stuff up. Now normally, they kind of look like little star-shaped cells. And they do a lot more than just act as macrophages, but we won't talk about that. They do communicate with neurons, but don't worry about that. The main thing that we need to know about is that whenever we have injury, the microglia round up so that they can crawl. You can't crawl when you have all these extensions. These aren't actually arms. These get in the way and break, and then you die. So they retract their extensions, round up, and then they migrate to the area of injury. And then they eat cell debris or foreign invaders, and they help mount an immune response if things are out of hand. And they're going to work hand in hand with astrocytes to help clean up the mess. Astrocyte means star cell. And these are definitely stellate cells. So they look like microglia, just bigger. And they have different types of processes. So coming off of the center there, some of those processes are going to go and uh, maybe wrap around a blood vessel or something like that. BV blood vessel. This would be an in-foot process. That's just what we call them. I wish I knew why. But they go and wrap around blood vessels. And so if you'll take a look at this image, the white um, stain is just showing us an intermediate filament called gliofibrillary acidic protein. You find it in astrocytes. The red is showing us some connexins, um, as we'll find out in just a little bit. Spoiler alert. Uh, astrocytes form gap junctions with each other. Uh, so we don't really care about that, but you can see pretty clearly there's a blood vessel running through this image. And that's because of the input processes that surround it. So there's one of the processes. The others are shown down below in the cartoon. So some of them are going to go around the nodes to help buffer all the ions that are coming in and out. So those would be perinodal processes because they're near the node. Uh, let's go ahead and have this axon form a synapse over here. I know it's kind of ugly. Sorry. Here it's even uglier. Then we also have perisynaptic processes. So perinodal around the node, perisynaptic around the synapse. And that's again to help clean up ions and neurotransmitters as I'm sure you guessed. So that third part of the synapse that we often find. That would be the perinodal process, I'm sorry, the perisynaptic process of an astrocyte. And what we're going to find there, a whole bunch of uh, neurotransmitter transport proteins to clean them up. Because some neurotransmitters can be toxic if they build up. Hopefully you remember glutamate toxicity from last semester. We want to avoid it. And the way that we avoid it is with glutamate transporter proteins. If we get rid of those glutamate transporter proteins, we see excitotoxicity. So, here we're looking at data from mice that lack glutamate transporters on astrocytes. They still have them on neurons, but not astrocytes. What we can see is that they don't grow as well in panel A, so their body weight never quite reaches that of their wild-type littermates. So the open circles, plus plus, that means they have two copies of the glutamate transporter. The minus minus, the filled, no copies. Those are the knockout mice. Notice they don't get as big. They also don't live as long, so panel B is an important one to look at. They start dying pretty rapidly. 
mice should not die within a couple of weeks of life. <clears throat> but you can see they start dying quickly. And the reason is shown in panel C. They have a lot of seizures. And they measure these seizures with EEG that's shown in panel D. The reason they generate seizures is because of too much glutamate. That glutamate essentially gets to operate with volume transmission because we don't have the perisynaptic processes that can clean it up. Without the glutamate transporters there, no glutamate cleanup, so it spills out and hyperexcites neurons. It's not a good thing. So astrocytes help prevent that. They're also going to help feed neurons, right, because they contact the blood vessel. So they can pull out glucose, shuttle it over to active neurons. It's a wonderful thing. And when things go bad, astrocytes form a glial scar. We can see that very clearly on the bottom here. Uh, they've stained for glial fibrillary acidic protein again. You can see a whole lot of astrocytes right near the site of injury on the right. That's a, an area that's undergoing inflammation because of the injury. So the astrocytes change their morphology, they change their shape, and they essentially quarantine off the area. Now, of course, astrocytes don't work alone. They form a network. It takes a village, whatever that means. In this case, the village is a whole bunch of astrocytes. Now, those astrocytes can also form gap junctions with oligodendrocytes, a special type called satellite oligodendrocytes. They don't make the myelin. They usually hang around like the cell body, and they kind of act like other astrocytes. Anywho, by sharing their cytoplasm, those, that single astrocyte can now buffer a whole lot more glutamate from this synapse. If this synapse is really active and I start to fill up this astrocyte with a whole bunch of glutamate, it's going to have a hard time picking it up. But if I share the burden with my neighbors through a whole bunch of gap junctions, now I have the buffering power of three astrocytes or four or five, and next thing you know, we got a village. So many astrocytes are going to function together as a unit to help take care of neurons. They pull out glucose from the blood and deliver it to active neurons. They make sure that potassium doesn't build up too much at the nodes. They make sure glutamate doesn't build up too much at the synapse. They do a lot for us. And that concludes our review of nerve cells. If anything seemed tricky, fill out the questions box so I can go through it in class. I'll see you later.